Welcome, I'm Yuan Nielsen. And I'm Lincoln Murphy, and this is Impact Weekly. We're here to help you make your customers successful. Each week, we answer your most pressing customer success management questions by relying on our years of experience with companies around the world. Let's get this going. Welcome, Impact Weekly, we are back. Today, we're going to talk about a very important topic that's, I mean, it's crucial for any company that's scaling. It's uh, one of the most asked questions, uh, I would say, especially from heads of customer success. And the question is basically, what is the method to calculate how many accounts a CSM should manage? Mm, okay. And before we start answering this, I think we need to really commend the person uh, who asked this question uh, uh, and to emphasize how to calculate this. Mm. I mean, most of the time, Lincoln, we get the question more like, how many accounts should a CSM manage? Right. Like, yeah, you know, like it's uh, this magical number. Uh, there is one answer, you know. <laughs> yeah, but I like, yeah, that's a good point. I like how they, they, they phrase it. The only, now, of course, I can't leave well enough alone. So my only tweak to that <laughs> would be... Yeah. Um, Instead of saying accounts, I would ask how many customers a CSM oh, yes. should manage and how to calculate that. And, you know, it's it's just a word, but I think words matter. And, I, you know, I, I think we need to be careful that, you know, we're not just working with accounts. And there's a reason why this matters. In the past, account managers literally just worked with a list of accounts. They would check in from time to time to make sure they the, the accounts were happy. Maybe they'd check to see if they wanted to buy something else or to see if they were going to renew. But like, that was it. That was what account management was. And when you start to work with customers and you're thinking of them more than just, you know, literally a, you know, just an account in a, in a system, these are actual customers with their own goals, things they need to do. They have teams on their side. They have, you know, they're, they're working with us at different stages of, uh, across a life cycle. Our relationship with them is, is, is different when we think of them as customers. When you bring all of that into it, um, all of a sudden, the way that you're going to work with them, the requirements to work with them, the resources needed to work with them, and, and the, the person hours, not to mention systems and, and, and processes and workflows and all of that, that all comes into play. So now when you go back and say, how do I calculate how many customers a CSM is going to work with? Well, that's a little bit more complex. Yeah, definitely. I think that's, uh, and that's actually, actually ex exactly the, where we're going to go with this, when we're going to go help this person now. But also I want to add to that, um, kind of zooming out here. I think it's also why this co question comes up a lot is because we also need to understand how a CSM organization typically evolves, right? So, I mean, um, when you start off a, a new a startup company, I mean, you, you probably, hopefully you have a customer success manual already, but a lot of times there is no one until you have your f a few couple of customers going. And then there is always this lag effect where you kind of you invest a lot in, in sales and, and bringing new customers in. And I mean, depending on, on the pace there and how many customers you add every month and so on, there is, uh, you need, of course, a customer success organization to, uh, to, uh, to onboard and to you know, uh, take care of the customers going forward. So I think that's also part of the puzzle here is that there is like this little bit lag, um, and, and this is also why, I mean, in the most cases, I would say that the typical customer success organization is understaffed uh, because <laughs> many reasons, but but one of the reasons is I think we, it's a it's a lag. I mean, if you don't have any customers, you you of course don't need a customer success, man success manager, uh, and so on. So, and Sorry. when you grow really fast, it, it's you you don't ramp enough customer success managers to to uh, properly, uh, you know, do customer success. So I think this adds to the complexity here as well. Absolutely. And I think, 
uh, that that lag effect, I think, is a really great way to to look at it. And of course, you know, what we want to do is get to a point where we can have some predictability and 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 be able to sort of um, you know plan ahead. Um, how do we do that? Well, we have to know what goes into actually making a customer successful across the different life cycle stages so that we can know, you know, again, how many person hours are going to be needed for, yeah. uh, you know, to, to ensure that a customer is going to be successful. And then we can take, you know, the forecast from sales and we can say, all right, well, over the next quarters, you know, this is how many customers are going to come in. So this is how many CSMs or other individual contributors will need, you know, maybe in onboarding or, or other life cycle stage specific roles. Um, yeah. And we can actually get ahead of this thing, but your, your, your characterization of customer success as uh, being a bit lagging to, to sales, I think is, is spot on. And it's, it's where we've come from historically. It's where a lot of companies have come from operationally but it's something we need to get out in front of. Exactly. I think that's, uh, and, and I think you need to, um, I mean, we'll, we'll get into that later, but I think the, the main point here is that if you start looking at it as customers, you start looking at uh, what we could achieve with the customer base we have, with the potential they have, what they're trying to achieve. I mean, that's also, that's also something you can bring to the management team and say, we need more resources if that's what you want and need. And based on the forecast of how many customer sales will bring in coming 12 months. I mean, I think that's also sometimes missing when we, when we, when we do the planning. We, we, haven't built, we haven't built a foundation to how many CSMs we, will, we, we need now and we will need. Um, so uh, that's also something we need to consider when we do this. Right. I mean, I think a lot of times where, where sort of forward looking planning is, is actually done. Um, and a lot of times it's not, it's not done because we're so focused on just the here and now, but where it's exactly. done, it doesn't, it doesn't sync up with sales. It doesn't take into consideration what's, what's in the pipeline. It doesn't take into consideration what sales goals are for the upcoming quarters. And so even where we're planning, we're not, we're still going to be sort of lagging behind because we're not taking into consideration um, all of the growth from, uh, from sales. So we're just not, we're not figuring that in and that's a problem. Yeah. And a lot of times it's like the CFO, <laughs> I mean, the CFO sets the plan more or less because they look at mm. the, you know, this is the, the amount of ARR we have and this is how many CSM we will need. Uh, so this is where say, this is where customer success needs to uh, yeah take charge uh, and make the plan and build a plan from a business perspective, but make it realistic and make it uh, focused around where how we can bring customers uh, to their goals and and how how we need to work to, to do that. So I think this is where it comes really interesting. For sure, and I, I think so. Going back to what you said about you know like a CFO kind of building the plan, I think oftentimes um, those plans are, well, they're not built from the actual required operational aspect of customer success management. They're built from some type of benchmark. Yeah. And th those can be really old uh, and completely irrelevant uh, because this differs, of course, a lot between businesses, between um type of product you have, the type of customer you serve and so on. Yeah, I think, um, you know, th this goes back to, so the, the question being asked correctly, how to calculate this. But again, the question we often get is you know, how many, how many CSMs or how many customers can a CSM, um, you know, work with. And, yeah. and I think that's a benchmark that, that is a number that people, have wanted to have that, that magical, you know, one size fits all answer for forever. I remember, you know, well over 10 years ago, you know, there was a VC that said um, at the, at, at their previous company where they were CEO, they had, you know, CSMs working, they had, you know, $2 million in ARR per CSM was their rule. Well, because they were a venture capitalist and here I just repeated it and 
somebody's going to take that, not listen to the rest of this <laughs> and run with it. But because they were a venture capitalist, they thought, oh, you know, here, here's the here's the smartest person in the room who has all of our money in their pocket. So we're going to listen to them. But that may have been true at their company, but it's just not something that is is true in in every context at all. And so um, that was something that threw people off. And then, you know, at, at the very least, even if that was quote unquote true somehow, um, that would still be an account management way of looking at it. Like, you know, we're just going to say that a CSM can handle X amount of revenue, you know, that, that a, a CSM can, can work with a book of business that has this much revenue. Okay. That's fine, I guess, if the CSM is not actually doing anything with the customers. But again, once you start actually helping customers be successful, you know, real customer success, um, <laughs> that way of thinking, it, it quickly starts to break down. It just does not work in reality. So if your CFO is coming to you with numbers that were pulled from some sort of benchmark report, um, this is where you as head of customer success need to advocate for yourself and for your team and push back on those numbers. Um, because if they're not based in reality and you agree to them, it's probably not going to end well for anybody. Like you're not going to, you're not going to actually hit the, the goals that the CFO has put out there and you're going to set everybody up for, for, for failure. So, yeah. you know, this is where you really need to push back, but that's why you need to have a clear understanding of how to calculate this for your team your unique situation exactly and i think to add to that one uh, another like misunderstanding or uh, when, when you just group customers based on arr or similar is that you kind of define them like you know this tech touch and uh, high touch <laughs> and so on um i mean that's uh, that's uh, that's another uh linked problem to this i would say yeah you know, and I, I have to take some of the blame for that. Um, you know, that was something we were promoting um, also at least 10 years ago. <laughs> um, yeah. The thing is, we've evolved. We, you know, the more contact th those early ideas had with customers, the more we realized that that wasn't um, how things actually play out in reality. And so here we are, um, you know, well over a decade into this thing we call customer success management, we understand better now that um, segmenting customers by what they pay us, grouping them by simply what they what they are charged on a monthly basis is not um, a, an effective way to create uh, a coverage model that's going to give your customer not only their appropriate experience, but do so in a way that truly is scalable, that allows us to use our resources internally as, as efficiently as possible. Um, that segmenting customers based on what you pay is really just a continuation of that old school account management way of thinking. And again, it starts to break down once you get into, you know, a, a need to scale and need to become more efficient. Um, a, you know, all of those, all of those pressures that are going to be on any, um, any part of the business, um, they're going to, the, the, the cracks are going to be exposed pretty quickly when you're, when you're basing things off of um, just what our customers pay us. And, and I think yeah. we need to be looking at what is a customer's appropriate experience? What, in other words, what has to happen for the customer to be successful? Yeah. Um, what resources are required to do that on our end and yeah. uh, go from there. If you don't do that and you just base your, you know, on, on what your customers pay you, um, again, it's going to be very difficult for you to actually deliver their appropriate experience, which means at some point they're going to churn out or they're certainly not going to expand. Um, it's just going to ultimately be a, a less efficient operation. No, but I think that's, uh, let's, uh, to help this person further, mm -hmm. maybe we should like start zooming in on like, how should, how should we calculate, um, and, uh, what to consider here? So. Yeah, I mean, I want to I want to make sure that we we give some very concrete um, uh, directions here. So, I suggest grouping customers by shared appropriate experience, which means yeah. you have customers that that all have 
essentially the same uh, experience in terms of interactions, uh, the modalities of interaction, the, 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 the types of interactions that they would have with the people on your team. You group them together like that. You create what we call a coverage model um, yep. that matches that appropriate experience. And, you know, if you have customers that pay you very little, but they have an appropriate experience that, that, um, that you can't deliver because it's not cost effective, you know, in the past, and the historical way of doing things is to say, well, that customer, they don't pay it. They don't pay us enough. So we're going to give them a lesser experience. And that just perpetuates churn in that segment. You yeah. need to be deliberate and say, those are customers we shouldn't be doing business with. On the flip side, you may have customers that pay you a lot, but their appropriate experience would be something that looks similar to what you're giving to those lower revenue customers right now, because they have their own internal resources. They have, they have the experience. They don't need a lot of help from you. So you know, we, we really need to understand what our customer's appropriate experience is and group our customers together like that. That's going to be the, the thing, the, the real basis for calculating um, how many customers we can truly work with uh, as a CSM. Like you, you, if you don't know those things, um, you're kind of starting from the wrong place. Exactly. And then, we, we, you need to map that through the life cycles, right? Yeah. So, you know, this is what we call it life cycle capacity planning is because if we look at the discrete life cycle stages that customers go through, um, there are uh, sort of different interaction um, uh, frequency and, and sort of modality of, of interaction that's going to happen across those different life cycle stages. We may spend a lot of time with a customer in the early stages and onboarding, perhaps in, in adoption. Um, yeah. the, the way that we're interacting with them, maybe more one-to-one, -one, uh, maybe doing more, more training, um, maybe working with them more to uh, configure their accounts to, to in, you know, do more integration. Once they come out of adoption, maybe there's, there's less one-on-one -on -one interaction that we're going to have to have with them. Uh, they move into more of a one-to-many or asynchronous type of interaction modality yeah. and understanding how that works across the different life cycle stages. And then at various points, you know, we, we may have to spend more time with them, you know, during uh, renewal, we may need to spend some more time with them where there are expansion opportunities. So across the life cycle, you're going to have different um, requirements in terms of your own resources. So you have to know those things in order to be yeah. able to, to really calculate um, how many individual contributors across the different life cycle stages you're going to need to have. If, if it's a CSM doing everything across all those life cycle stages, okay, that's fine. You need to know how many customers are in each stage. So you know how, you know, how many person hours, and this is where you, once you start doing this, you start to see like, there's a lot of moving pieces here. <laughs> and, and if you only have a C, you know, one CSM, um, or, you know, multiple CSMs, but you only have CSMs. You don't have those life cycle stage um, specialists like onboarding and you look at your, your CSMs and, and they're spending 25 or 50% of their time with customers and onboarding. You see where the other amount of time is not enough to work with customers in every other life cycle stage. So you start to see where there's a need yeah. maybe to break those out. But like, this is where it's, it's really critical to understand this stuff. If you want to be able to do real capacity planning and you want to be able to look at, you know, what, what is our, what is our actual capacity over the next couple of quarters and how many, how many people do we need? How many people will we need to hire? Um, yeah. all of those different things. It's, it's, uh, it's, it's important. There's a lot of moving pieces there, but yeah. it's critical. It is. And it's a real eye opener. And I think this creates transparency to the organization when you do this, because I mean, of course, you, I mean, if, if you don't want to guess or, or put like just a number there, this is how you, you have to dig in here and uh, do some work. I think uh, too often we, we kind of, you know, do it too high level. Uh, some things we do too high level. And this is one of the things I think we're, you need to spend some time here to do this, to get it right. And, Absolutely. And, 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 and what I've seen is that you actually realize that a lot of things that needs to be happening uh, in addition to the number of people you need uh, around processes, uh, also perhaps about clarifying roles and responsibilities here. So it's a great exercise. Um, 
we won't cover every detail in the podcast, but we have in the Impact Academy, we, we, we have this uh, whole part of this in one of the programs. So, Right. For the head of customer success, one of one of our programs is really dedicated to to it's it's dedicated to, to, to build or to scaling out your operation. And, and this is such an important piece of that. Um, and, and, you know, it's regardless of, you know, how you, whether you go through Impact Academy and learn this or, or whatever, you really want to be thinking about all of these different elements. Um, it's, it, this is the way. So to kind of circle back to what you said, you know, originally about how often, you know, a CFO will come with some numbers, perhaps pulled from industry benchmarks, which are, you know, normalized yeah. and generalized at best and often just misleading <laughs> at, at exactly. worst. Um, this is the way that you push back. This is the way that you advocate for yourself and for your team to say, no, here's what we actually need. And here's why, right? So not just here's some high level numbers. Here's, here's how we came up with that. You can argue that you can, you can break down the logic and, and they can you know, argue the finer points and that's fine, but at least you're showing your work. You're showing how you came up with these things. And it's going to make for, you know, not necessarily initially the most pleasant conversation, but it's certainly going to make for a much more fruitful conversation. And you're going to get closer to where, you know, to, to numbers that are more, that are realistic. Um, exactly. and, and I think that's what we're all looking for here. I think that's what everybody is looking for. The CFO is just going with numbers that they have available. Yeah. And, and exactly. And, if you and don't... most of the time they take the number that they, 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 they do the, they have to do the planning. And if no one else helps exactly. them with the planning, they will just put the number there. Exactly. So you can either be a part of it uh, or, or you can just take what is given to you. And, and I would say be a part of it, um, do this work, and, yeah. and you and your team will be much more successful. And your customers yeah, too, and, by the way. Yeah, and be bold here, I would say, because there is a lot of, I mean, if you don't make this plan and you don't show how you can do a lot more for your customers by, by being having a better structure, having more resources, I mean, the company's losing out there. So be bold, do this, and and uh, and show the value you you can provide in the customer success team. Because sometimes I think we heads of customer success we hold back a little bit instead of being a little bit more bold with what we can do. Uh, but we also need, of course, the resources to do the, those all those things. Right. Well, I think that's a whole topic for another another podcast. Is yeah. Just, uh, yeah. The, the, <laughs> the boldness or lack thereof sometimes with heads of customer success and why that is. But um, I think to sort of round out the discussion yeah. today, you know, let's, let's do that thing where we give three very practical um, ideas here. I'll, and, and I'll start with one. And, and that is, I said it earlier, I'm going to repeat myself here, but it's, it's that important. Think customers, not accounts, you know, consider what it takes to actually make the customer successful across all of the different life cycle stages. And, probably all of your customers are not the same. So you need to think about, and I, I encourage you to look at appropriate experience. Think about your customers and what it's gonna to take to make all of your different and, and unique segments of your customers successful. Great point. Second point here now, uh, make sure you have a logic for the number of customers uh, you allocate to the CSMs. Even if you haven't had it in the past, start now. Just make this uh, capacity planning analysis. And the last thing here, I think, is that we mentioned it earlier, but make this plan for how you uh, can not only reach your companies, but even more importantly, your customers' uh, goals with, with the team you have in customer success. I think that's the most important takeaway here. I think. So, uh, so those were the three things to do. Uh, thanks, everyone. And see you all soon. Hey, thanks for listening. Do you want to bring your customer success to the next level? Check out Impact Academy. We have training programs for customer success managers and for leaders in customer success.